Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad. Wa ala alihi sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad. Wa barik wa sallim. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> Previously we were speaking of... Um, the end actions of a human being that that is going to be the greatest of all of people's actions um, and there there is a dua that uh, oh allah make my last action my best action uh, uh, and also make the best day the day that i return to you uh, and so when we have good end actions, inshallah, our entire book of deeds uh, and uh, everything ends off in a good note. So that is probably the most important thing we should also make dua for. Always make dua for an ending with iman and a good ending. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us away in a state that we are in his obedience. Uh, someone actually compiled many different stories and and. It's a, it's a book in Arabic. Uh, how many different ulama passed away when they were in sujood? So they have a, it's actually a very large book. I mean, at least 100 pages. And it has stories of so many ulama who passed away while they, they were in sajda. I'm sure many of them, if not, uh, probably not all of them, but many of them made dua for that that they wanted to pass away in a state that they were in sujood. Because there's a hadith, أَقَرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدِ إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَىٰ وَهُوَ السَّاجِدِ وَكَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَةُ وَالسَّلَامِ That the closest a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they are in sajda. That is when our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at its height. That is when our praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at its height. Our hearts are connected to Allah. Physically, we're, we're in, in sujood, our heads are on the floor. So that is literally the best uh, position that we can be in terms of our relationship with Allah. So many ulama, they passed away in that state. Many people pass away in that state uh, that they're in sujood. And that's a very good ending. Uh, we can make dua for that or just in general terms, always make dua that we pass away with iman. Uh, that is quite important. Uh, otherwise, everything that, that we have done in our lives would go to waste if we don't have Iman. Iman is a condition for us to be successful. So without the condition, uh, nothing else matters. <clears throat> so we were talking about uh, many different ahadith, many different incidents in this regard. So we'll continue, inshallah, talking about different incidents of the Salaf. And as I mentioned before, the Salaf are the first three generations the generation of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sahaba, thereafter the Tabi'een, those who came and who saw the Sahaba but did not see Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Atba'u Tabi'een, those who followed the followers. Tabi'een means followers, Sahaba means companions, and Atba'u Tabi'een, those who did not see any of the Sahaba but they saw uh, the the Tabi'een, and many of the Imma. Like we have Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, they are amongst the Atba'u Tabi'in. Imam Abu Hanifa was a bit earlier than them, so he's amongst the Tabi'in, amongst the last portion of the Tabi'in. He saw very few Sahaba, but because he saw some of the Sahaba, he's counted amongst the Tabi'in. So these are among the Salaf. So Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, all of them are amongst the, the Salaf because they fit into that those first three generations. So we are continuously uh, recommended and, and, and told, and this is actually from the hadith, because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for these three generations. So we're supposed to always follow their example. These were the exemplary people. Definitely the Sahaba uh, were absolute uh, exemplaries that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uh, talks about their iman in the Qur'an. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first chapter in the second chapter surah al-baqarah in the very beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when it is told to the people believe as 
the people have believed. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually talking about the Sahaba. People are told, believe as the Sahaba have believed. Uh, so their iman, the, the, the belief and the faith of the Sahaba is basically the standard for everyone else that comes after. So that is why we always try to uh, look at the stories of the Salaf, try to take some type of uh, you know, admonition, some type of uh, lesson from their lives. Uh, because uh, they are, we are actually commanded to to follow their example. So there was among the Salaf, I'm reading a, a story, Abdul Aziz ibn Abi Rawad. He is a narrator of hadith as well. He said, حضرت رجلا عند الموت يلقا لا إله إلا الله فقال في آخر ما قال هو كافر بما تقول وما تعالى ذلك. So he says here, uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Abi Rawad among the tabi'een or atba'u tabi'een he said that I saw an individual and he was in the throes of death this person was about to pass away and there were people around him they were telling him say la ilaha illallah or they were saying la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah and we're supposed to do this when, it, when we feel that a person is going to pass away uh, if we're near them we shouldn't command them to say la ilaha illallah rather we should start saying the shahada out loud and that will remind the person in, in that time of difficulty that they should say it and it's also uh, written in the books of fiqh that if they do say la ilaha illallah then everyone else should just stay silent and it's actually makru for anyone it's disliked for anyone to come in and give salam or speak to the individual just leave them and let la ilaha illallah, the shahada, be their last words. If they decide to speak or something else happens and, you know, they, they say something, then again, you should start saying la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And then they will be reminded and inshallah, they will say. Uh, and we're not told to command them because if you do command them, they're in a very difficult situation. They may respond by saying, I don't want to say it. You know, don't, don't tell me what to do. Uh, and, and we don't want that. So anyway, this uh, narrator, Abdul Aziz ibn Abi Rawad, he was there. This person was passing away. All the people around this person were saying, La ilaha illallah. However, this individual, right before he passes away, he says that he is a kafir. He says he doesn't believe. And he dies without iman. Uh, he passes away as a disbeliever. But in his life, in, in the time that he lived on, on the world, in the world, he was a a Muslim or apparently a Muslim. He did everything that Muslims do. Uh, his family was Muslim. And right at the last second, he loses his iman. He says that he doesn't believe. So this person, he, he was curious. So he asked about, you know, his situation. So he asked his family, like, you know, what, what happened here? Uh, you know, is, was there any sign that this person... Uh, you know, was going to leave Iman. Did, did he have any doubt during his life? What was his situation? So the family told him that this person was a drunkard. He was habitual of drinking wine. And this was his regular practice. Uh, so then we can see that the harms of, of, of sin, right? Uh, definitely, if we pass away with Iman, inshallah, if we, if we, you know, drank wine or did whatever we did, inshallah, ultimately, we have high hopes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive us and enter us into Jannah. That is our hope and that is our belief as well. As long as you pass away with Iman, that, that's the struggle of life, dying in a state that you have Iman. But to secure those last seconds, because the last seconds matter the most, to secure that amount or, you know, to secure la ilaha illallah right at the end, we have to do good deeds throughout. And it's not like we can skip out on good deeds either. We're, we're commanded to do them. But we have to do all these things. So just at that last second, it will come and help us, inshallah. Uh, then this narrator, فَكَانَ عَبْدُ الْعَزِيزِ يَقُولِ اتَّقُوا الذُّنُوبِ فَإِنَّهَا هِيَ الَّتِي أَوْقَعَتْهُ so he used to say after this, he used to narrate the story to people. This, uh, this person who, who saw this incident, he would tell people the story that I saw this happen before my eyes. And after the story, he would say this, the moral of the story, fear sins, fear the sins that you commit. 
because these were the things that caused this individual to lose his iman. This person didn't have doubt or you know whatever it may have been, but it was it was this one aspect in his life that he never gave up, nor did he do toba from it. He didn't repent from it. Allahu a'lam. But this is what happened to this person. So this is a very big lesson for us. That we should try our best to avoid sin as much as possible. It's very common we hear individuals saying that, you know, I'm young now. And even if we don't say it, sometimes this is our rationale. Uh, we, 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 you know, have this cognitive dissonance where we know what, what is correct. And we, we have to make an excuse for what we're doing because it's incorrect. So a person may say, I'm young, I have the ability to do what I want to do. Let me enjoy at the moment. Inshallah, I'll live till I'm at least 60. I'll do toba when I'm 50. That gives me about, 50, about 10 years or so that I can do hajj and Allah will forgive me, inshallah, because we know that when a person uh, does a successful hajj, their, their sins are forgiven. And there's many other things that cause a person's sins to be forgiven. But what we don't realize is that type of attitude may cause this type of result. So we need to be you know, vigilant uh, right now as we are young or if we're old at all times. We should be vigilant and, and, and we don't know even. Uh, we may plan to pass away after 60, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have decided that at 35 years of age that we're going to die. Right? We, we don't know when we're going to die. And that's the whole point. That's the whole test. And Imam Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he, he, he summarizes uh, a bunch of these different stories afterwards. He, he says here, فَالْخَوَاتِمُ مِرَاثُ السَّوَابِقِ He says, end results, the final end that we have, that is a result of what we have done in the past. And that's clear. What we did in our lives, all of our entire lives will be summarized in that last moment. If we were successful in our lives, uh, you know, we worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we were supposed to. We believed in him. We did what we were supposed to do. Yes, we, we will fall into error and we will sin. But the whole point is to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. He created us such that we will sin. So if anyone believes that they're not going to sin, then they're deluded. They are going to sin. No one here is a, a messenger, right? No one here is a prophet. But after sinning, we have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this, our entire lives are is summarized in that last moment. And, uh, you know, we, we're only fooling ourselves if we think that we can do everything contrary to Islam and wait for the last second and say, la ilaha illallah. Uh, none of us have experienced that last moment. We don't know what happens. Uh, many people, you know, the, there's many stories of, you know, even Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he actually, uh, Iblis came to him, Shaytan came to him at the end of his life and was trying to uh, deceive him. So these things may happen. We may feel like we have complete control, but at those last moments, we may not have any control. Maybe a Shaytan will come to us and tell us different things and try to deceive us. So at that moment, our lives will be summarized and what we have done throughout will be summarized in our last uh, action. And then he also says, uh, This is why the Salaf, the first three generations, they used to fear most a bad ending. More than anything else, the, the thing they feared absolutely the most was to have a negative ending. And then he says, uh, And some people were among the Salaf. They used to feel bad for their previous actions. So as Muslims, we believe that if you have a sincere toba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive. But still, because they knew about this, they knew this hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that all of our actions are summarized at that last moment. They used to sit, still feel very scared of, of their previous actions. And uh, he says, وَقَدْ قِيلْ إِنَّ قُلُوبَ الْأَبْرَارِ مُعَلَّقَةٌ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ يَقُولُونَ بِمَاذَا يَخْتِمُ لَنَا وَقُلُوبُ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ مُعَلَّقَةٌ بِالسَّوَابِقِ يَقُولُونَ مَاذَا سُبِقَ لَنَا So 
the hearts of the pious or you know the the good people the god fearing people is connected to the end result so those who fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're continuously thinking how will i die what will be my condition when i die and the hearts of the awliya and the friends of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're even more pious right the, the people who fear allah they are pious and then you have the awliya the friends of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are very close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imam ibn rajab says they're not worried about their future they're worried about their past. And the reason for this is because the future is a reflection of the past. Right? Now, we are commanded not to lose hope. So no matter what we have done in the past, there's always hope for us. Even if we're you know, 90 years old and, and we just accepted Islam today, there's complete hope for us, inshallah. So we're not supposed to lose hope. But these people, because they're continuously thinking about this, and they know that the last second of my life is a result of what I have done. They're continuously fearing what they have done in the past. So we have to be very careful and we have to ponder over this on a daily basis. We have to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take my life today. And if he does so, what will be my last second? If my last second is a summary of everything that I've done in my life, what can I say about that last second? Is it going to be successful? Or is it going to be a very difficult last second? Am I going to pass away with Iman or not? And remember, a person that passes away with Iman, they're completely successful. And a person that passes away without Iman, they, they've left this world with absolutely nothing. So more stories about the, the Salaf's fear of their fate. Uh, here, Imam Raj, Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he quotes a few stories. So he says, وَبَكَى بَعْضُ الصَّحَابَ عِنْدَ مَوْتِهِ فسئل عن ذلك فقال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن الله تعالى قبض خلقه قبضتين فقال هؤلاء في الجنة وهؤلاء في النار ولا أدري في أي القبضتين كنت So he, he narrates the story and he said that some of the Sahaba they had a certain characteristic about them that when they were going to pass away they start crying right and so that, that happens to everyone. They, they think about their, literally their whole life flashes before their eyes and they're thinking about what they've done. But these Sahaba are crying and they're asked about their, why, why they're crying. So they said, I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has uh, held his creation in, in two handfuls. So th this is metaphorical, uh, obviously. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created two groups. But the way Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa puts it is very uh, baligh, very eloquent. He's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has held his creation in two handfuls. And he has decided that this one is going to Jannah and this one is going to Jahannam. And I don't know which group I, I am in at that moment of time. I, di I didn't know which group I'm, I'm going to be in. And so I'm scared about that. Uh, so fear of, of the last uh, moment in, in life. Some of the Salaf, they said that uh, that the, the pious cry mostly over something that is already written down. And that's their fate. They don't know what their fate is going to be. Imam Sufyan, and whenever they say Sufyan, it can mean one of the two. There's two very great uh, scholars of hadith in the past, Sufyan al thawri or Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So un unless they specify, then we can't be sure. But Imam ibn Rajab says that Sufyan, he said to some pious people, Hal abkaka qattu ilm Allahi fiqh. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge regarding you ever caused you to cry? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where you're going to go. So has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge regarding you ever caused you to cry? So Sufyan is talking to a pious person. He asks, asks him this question. This person says that this, this one thing that you're mentioning has left me in such a state that I can never be happy. I can never be happy in this dunya because I'm always reminded that Allah has already decided where I'm going to go. And I don't know where I'm going to go. So I, I can't be happy. 
But remember, as, as we just mentioned in the previous narrations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is, is, is unfathomable. We cannot understand it. But what we do understand is the end result of a person is in coordinates and, and according to how they behaved in their lifetime. So if a person behaved very well, everything was going perfectly, at the end, they're not going to uh, lose their iman. Unless, of course, they were hiding certain things that no one else knows. Hiding uh, doubts. They never fully believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what you call a munafiq. A munafiq is an individual who exhibits Islam, but inside their hearts, they don't have it. So if a person's a munafiq, then at the last moment, it's going to become clear. Uh, but if they're not, and, and they, everyone knows their condition of their hearts. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we all can feel within ourselves where we are. Uh, and if we're true to ourselves, we can understand. Uh, so at that last moment, that will come out. And then he says, وَكَانَ سُفْيَانِ اشْتَدُّ قَلَقُهُ مِنَ السَّوَابِقِ وَالْخَوَاتِيمِ So Sufyan, the same imam, he would be so worried about his past as well as his future. So like we said before, the pious fear their future and the extremely pious fear their past. So he used to fear both. He used to cry and he used to say, uh, he used to cry and he used to, he used to say, when people asked him why he would cry so much, he would say that I don't know if in the lawhul mahfuz I am written as a person that is misfortunate. And alhamdulillah, he was not amongst those people. As we can see that the, what's called the sunnatullah, sunnah means the method. Right? When we say sunnah of Rasulullah, the method of Rasulullah. So sunnatullah, the method of Allah, is that if a person lives and leads a sincere life, at the last moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to take away their iman. ويبكي ويقول أخاف أن أسلب الإيمان عند الموت. He used to cry, and then people used to ask him, and he would say that I fear that iman would be taken away from me before I die. So he would fear the past as well as the future. He would fear the past by saying that I fear what was written regarding me in the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the preserved tablet, the Lawh al Mahfuz, and he would cry and he would say that I fear that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala you know, or it's written down that my iman will be taken away before I pass. Malik bin Dinar, also a tabi'i, a great scholar of the past, in the first three generations, he used to stand up the whole night, he used to pray salah, and he would grab, he would hold his beard. And amongst the Arabs, when, when they hold their beard, it shows that they're very worried or that they're very saddened. In the hadith, it says when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saddened by anything or he was pondering deeply, he would hold his beard. Otherwise, they wouldn't really hold their beards. So he would hold his beard and he would say, Oh Allah, you know who is going to Jannah and who's going to Jahannam. And I don't know where Malik is going to go. He's referring to himself in the third person. I don't know where I'm going to go. So he would, he would be worried the whole night. So this, this fear was not just, you know, for us at, at times it's academic. Like, okay, I learned about Malik bin Dinar. I learned about Sufyan al thawri or Sufyan ibn Uyayna, these stories about them. But this same fear would keep them from sleeping at night. Uh, so this was something real for them. And this is why they are the salaf. We have to get to that point where we fear. Uh, a person, when a person fears something, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save them from that. And if we don't have that fear, we don't have that realization that that is going to happen to us one day, then we don't know how we're going to end up. وَقَالَ حَاتِمْ الْأَصَمْ Another one of the salaf, he said, مَنْ خَلَى قَلْبُهُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ أَرْبَعَةِ أَخْطَارِ فَهُوَ مُخْتَرْ فَلَا يَأْمَنُ الشَّقَاءِ so he says that a person whose heart is free from four things, four worries, this person does not have these four worries, then that person is deceived and may end up being amongst the misfortune people, misfortunate people. So he's saying that if, if our hearts do not have 
these four characteristics, then we should fear for ourselves because we're actually, uh, you know, beguiling ourselves where we're, we're deluded. Al-awwal, the first thing, خَطَرُوا يَوْمِ الْمِثَاقِ حِينَ قَالْ هَؤُلَاءِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَلَا أُبَالِي وَهَؤُلَاءِ فِي النَّارِ وَلَا أُبَالِي فَلَا يَعْلَمْ فِي أَيِّ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ كَانَ So he says the first thing, out of four, is the fear of يَوْمُ uh, mithaq meaning uh, the end result. يَوْمُ mithaq is, is like قيامة, يَوْمُ القيامة. Uh, but he's referring to here in the past. Meaning, uh, when before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already decided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these people are going to Jannah and I don't care, I don't have to answer to anyone. I will put these people into Jannah. However, these people are going to Jahannam and I don't have to answer to anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't answer to anyone. This person does not know in which of the two he will be. So he's saying the first worry that a person must have in order to be free from worry, worry at the end, meaning not be misfortunate on Qiyamah. The first worry is the worry of which group am I in? Am I going to be amongst the people of Jannah or am I going to be amongst the people of Jahannam? Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that, there is no kind of you know, swaying his opinion. We, we can do absolutely nothing. Uh, on Qiyamah, if Allah says that you are going to Jannah, then no one can say that, no, he, he, this person, he or she deserves to go to Jannah, Jahannam. Uh, if Allah says this person is going to Jannah, no one can stop that. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this person is going to Jahannam, no one can stop that. Of course, there are certain times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows other people to intercede but that is another uh, thing to talk about later on. So that is the first thing. So the first thing was the absolute first thing, meaning before our own creation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided. If a person doesn't ponder over this, then this person is going to be misled. It's going to be deluded or amongst the, the negligent. That's what muhtar means, negligent. So that is the first thing. Number two is الثلاث, والشقاوة, أمن, أمن So the second thing Hatim al asam said is when the human being was created in the fetus in three stages of darkness. This is referring to uh, you know, the, the, the cover of the baby within the womb then there's three layers of darkness. There's three coverings of the mother's womb. That's something that is known in embryology. So when the child is in that womb of the mother and the angel comes to the child, and this is what the hadith that we're on, hadith number four, we actually discussed this. So the angel will call out that this individual is amongst the su'ada, the, the fortunate and happy people, meaning their end result is going to be good. Or this person is amongst the shaqawa or ashqiya, meaning the people who are uh, misfortunate. So he's saying, if you're not worried about this, then we need to be worried about this. This is something, this is a sign that we're doing good if we worry about this. And if we're not worrying about these four different things, then this means that we are being misled. We're being deceived by the dunya, by shaitan, by our own nafs and our own desires. So that was number two. Number three, الْمَطْرَعَ بِسَخْطِهِ So he's saying that the difficulties of Qiyamah, that's number three. The difficulties of Qiyamah, all the different things that, you know, resurrection or even before resurrection when we're in our graves, many different things will happen. We'll talk about that soon, inshallah, the different... Uh, uh, a hadith regarding the, the punishment or the, the rewards that a person will get in their grave. So he's saying the worry regarding that about after death. And he doesn't know, this individual doesn't know, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be happy with me or will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upset with me? So if you don't know if Allah is happy or upset with you, how can you be happy? That's that's what Imam Hatim is saying here. And number four, وَالْرَابِعْ 
يَوْمَ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ أَشْتَاتَ وَلَا يَدْرِي أَيُّ الطَّرِيقَيْنِ يَسْلُكُ بِهِ or يُسْلَكُ بِهِ So he's saying the last one is the day that people will be separated. And we're going to talk about the stages of Qiyama. There's a stage on Yawm al Qiyama where groups will be formed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will separate the group that will go to Jannah from the group that will go to Jahannam. <clears throat> so he's saying that if a person knows this, this is, there's going to come a day when there's going to be two groups, one going to Jahannam, one going to Jannah, and we don't know which group we're in. So how can we ever be happy? So we hear some of these different sayings of the Salaf, and they say that, you know, I was, I'm never happy, I can never be at peace. It's because they, they thought of this and they think of this continuously. They meditate over it so much that it's a reality for them. And happiness can come to a person when they're in a state of negligence, right? If we're not aware of worries and difficulties that are constantly troubling us, that is when we're going to be happy. If a person is continuously aware of, of their difficulties in their, in their life, then they can't be happy. And that's how people get depressed. And there's actually a hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very close to those people who, whose hearts break for the cause of Allah. Meaning this person's heart broke because they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they fear if they're going to be able to please him or not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are very close to Allah. So these are those people, the salaf, they say that, you know, I can't be happy or I'm depressed. And they're not depressed for anything regarding this world. If, if you notice, all four of these things that Hatim al-Asam said, they're dealing with either before we were created or after. Right? Number one, he's talking about before our creation, Allah has decided, are we going to Jannah or Jahannam? He's worried about that. Number two, what was the condition when we were in the wombs of our mothers, when the angel decided or when the angel called out, made the announcement that this person is either going to be fortunate or misfortunate? That's number two. Number three is after we die. So he just totally skipped the life of this dunya. What's going to happen when we're in the, in the graves? What's going to happen when we're resurrected? All the difficulties of Qiyamah. Will Allah be happy with us or upset with us? And number four, all the way at the end, when we're finally separated into groups, which group we're going to be in. So he, he's, he's not thinking of the dunya. So these people, their hearts break and, and, and they're very saddened because they're thinking of this. Now, this sadness does not deprive them from the mercy of Allah, meaning they don't lose hope. And this is the, the uh, salient feature of a believer. Uh, and this is what Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, that a believer is in between two situations. Half of their heart is filled with hope and the other half is fill, filled with fear and, and, and uh, also regret is also there. So this is a, a believer is not completely happy all the time. Sometimes you're happy because you're thinking about Jannah. You're thinking about, inshallah, I have high hopes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to enter a lot of people into Jannah. Inshallah, we're going to be among them. So that makes us happy. And whenever we go through difficulties, that will be a source of solace. But then at times when we're thinking about Jahannam and we're thinking about the difficulties of the hereafter, that should cause us to become sad. Uh, and and this, is, this is the meaning of having two hearts. The believer, it, it's metaphorical, obviously. The believer having two hearts, one filled with hope and one filled with fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so these, he, he, Imam Hatim was saying that a person must have these four worries inside their heart if they do so, inshallah, they will not be amongst those who are deluded, those who are negligent. And this will cause a person to want to do more a'mal, more good actions. And ultimately, it will lead to us having a good ending, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, another thing here is that the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, their condition. And of course, the people that we need to follow the most are the Sahaba. They feared the most what they feared was nifaq. And nifaq is the, the quality of a munafiq. So nifaq meaning at the end of a person's life, the truth is revealed and it is shown that they are not a true believer. And the Sahaba really feared this, uh, despite being the farthest away from it. But they still feared nifaq. That, is, that should tell us something that 
no matter who we are, what our situation is, we're praying five times a day, we're fasting on Ramadan, we're doing everything we got to do, we're paying the zakat, we still have to fear that what if I'm a munafiq? What if my iman is not 100% there? I don't fully know until I die what my end result is going to be. So regarding that, Imam Ibn Rajab used to say, وَمِنْ هُنَا كَانَ الصَّحَابَ وَمَنْ بَعْدَهُ مِنَ السَّلَفِ الصَّالِحِ يَخَافُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ النفاق وَيَشْتَدُّ قَلَقُهُمْ وَجَزَعُهُمْ مِنْ فَالْمُؤْمِنُ يَخَافُ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ النِّفَاقَ الْأَصْغَرُ وَيَخَافُ أَنْ يَغْلِبَ ذَلِكَ عَلَيْهِ عِنْدَ الْخَاتِمَةِ فَيُخْرِجُهُ إِلَى النِّفَاقِ الْأَكْبَرُ كَمَا تَقَدَّمْ أَنَّ دَسَائِسَ السُّوءَ الْخَفِيَةِ تُوجِبُ السُّوءَ الْخَاتِمَةِ So he is basically summarizing all of these different stories and he's saying that because of all of this that we have mentioned, these are the reasons that the Sahaba used to really fear nifaq as well as the salaf that came after the sahaba, they re really used to fear nifaq because they don't know what's going to happen. And in one hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa tells us that there's, there's more than one type of nifaq. The greater nifaq or being an actual munafiq is actually not even being a Muslim, meaning a person, they, they clearly exhibit Islam, but they themselves know that they're not a Muslim. That's, that's a highest level of being a munafiq. Uh, in English, it's called a hypocrite. Uh, they translate it as hypocrite uh, in English because a person uh, says what they don't do. And in this, uh, you know, the correlation between that, the English word and a munafiq is, a munafiq is saying that they're Muslim, but they don't have that inside. Uh, so that's the real munafiq. A real munafiq himself or herself knows clearly that they are faking. But most of the people are not a, a, a real munafiq. They're going to be a minor munafiq. And what is a minor munafiq? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa in one hadith says that if a person has these three qualities, then they are a munafiq. And this, he's referring to a minor munafiq, not a full real munafiq. Uh, number one when this person talks most of the time they're going to lie they're just habitual of lying and that 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 shows you the severity of telling lies that's number one when number two when they're trusted with something they they can't fulfill that trust they don't fulfill their trusts this includes someone's secrets this person goes and spreads the secret or someone trusts them with any other affair, they're unable to, to keep that trust. They betray other people's trust. And number three, when they make a promise to someone, I will do this for you, or you know, I got your back, or don't worry, I, I'm going to take care of it. They don't fulfill that promise. And these three are found within a person. They lie, they break their promises, and they cannot be trusted, um, meaning when they make the promise, when they make the promise, they, they break it, when they're trusted, they cannot be trusted. When these three are found in a person, they're a minor munafiq, right? meaning they have iman in their hearts, they believe that they're a Muslim, but none of their physical actions or in their spirituality resembles a Muslim. So Imam Ibn Rajab is saying here that the Sahaba and the Salaf, they used to fear greatly the minor nifaq. Because they knew inside, everyone can see, you know, feel inside their hearts where they are. If you are a real munafiq, you will easily be able to tell because you're only saying you're a Muslim and you know yourself that you're, you're not a, a Muslim. That would be a real munafiq. But for most of the people, that's not the situation. But the minor nifaq is really dangerous because a person might not be aware of it. And so the Sahaba and the Salaf, they used to always fear that they might be a minor munafiq. And the reason they feared this so much is because being a minor munafiq ends up, and the end result is that a person becomes a full munafiq right before they pass away. It, it builds and it develops to a point where it comes to its culmination right before death and a person ends up being a full munafiq and they declare in front of everyone that they no longer have iman and, and then everything is lost.
Uh, so that is a very fearful thing. And we all should make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves us from being a munafiq. Uh, we don't know 100%. Yes, you may be aware uh, if you are a full munafiq or we are not a full munafiq, we can easily ascertain that. But the minor nifaq, sometimes we're not even aware we're doing these things. We may be telling lies. We may be spreading falsehood or uh, disclosing other people's secrets. We're not fully aware of it. We're just, you know, very negligent. Uh, so we have to make dua for all of this. Another thing is that Rasulullah himself used to fear for the Sahaba, he used to fear for them a bad ending. And, you know, the Sahaba were to Rasulullah is like, the, is like his children. He raised him and, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we talked about this a while back in, in uh, another program that we did uh, regarding the Sira, the Sira uh, the Sira program or the Shama'il program of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we had uh, last year, where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is like our father. He's not our father, obviously. Uh, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, Muhammad is not the father of any of you. Uh, but also in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ The wives of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are the mothers of the believers. So to, you know, uh, compare the two verses, in one verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the biological father of any of the sahaba. But in the other verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that his wives are your mothers, meaning spiritual mother so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's our spiritual father so in that sense he used to worry about the sahaba and so one time a sahabi heard nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam say this dua and he would say it a lot and this is one dua that we can make ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala dinik oh the turner of hearts make my heart firm upon your deen ya muqallib al qulub oh the turner of hearts Thabbit qalbi ala dinik. Cause my heart to be firm upon Islam. So a sahabi heard this from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, O oh Rasulullah, do you fear for us? You know, you're making this dua for yourself that Allah keeps your heart firm. What about us? Do you fear that, you know, we're going to leave Islam also? Uh, obviously, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't have to fear for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already promised that all of his sins are forgiven. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, Naam, inna al-quloba bayna usbu'ayni min asabi'i Allahi Azza wa Jal yuqallibuha kayfa sha'a. He said, he replied that, yes, I do fear for you. The hearts of humanity is between, and this is again, a very beautiful and, and uh, metaphorical language. We have to make that clear every time. The hearts of, of the believers are between the fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns them as he wishes. So imagine how a human will have, you know, a person has a ring and, you know, they take the ring off and they're turning the ring. Or you have a coin and you turn the coin. You have, you know, heads and tails. So in the same way, just how easy it is to flip a coin, to move the coin, it's heads now, it's tails there. That's how our hearts are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has complete control over our hearts. So that is why we should make this dua. Oh Allah, you are the turner of hearts. I believe in that. So make my heart firm on iman. Don't turn it. Don't turn it around, oh Allah. Please do not turn it to tails, which is kufr. Keep it on heads, which is our iman. So this is what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the sahaba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full control. He does whatever he wants, however he wants. And we just have to be a good slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, he will keep us with iman. And that is the ultimate goal, is to pass away from this life with iman, inshallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, that he grants us iman all the way at the end, gives us tawfiq to profess iman, to have it truly in our hearts, to do our actions according to that iman during our life in dunya, and give us tawfiq to die with that iman, to have it on qiyamah in the grave as well, when he resurrects us, and allow us to go into jannah together with iman, inshallah.